Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks a lot. It's nice to be here as well. I wanted to talk a little bit um, about your career. Before you were at this global role, mm -hmm. uh, you were working in China and in the North Asia division. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the, the, the roles you had there and the work you did? Sure. I think the first two thirds of the career within the Unilever, by the way, I'm a kind of the Unilifer, so I joined Unilever <laughs> after my graduation. And I think the first two thirds of the career was majority in China mm -hmm. and in North Asia. So um, I have a short stint uh, in Japan as well for a, a period. Then I think around 2015 to 2018, I have the chance to be really moved to Singapore for three years to be in charge of the Southeast Asia supply chain for Unilever. Then after that, I'm moving back to China to hold for the North Asia supply chain role and to be personally very proud that I am the first local people, Chinese people, to take over that role. In past, it's always expatriate. Ah. Uh, so in history, it's really the first one for the local people. And hopefully after my role there, uh, the next generation will be majority Chinese, I assume. That's wonderful. Then I did that for three years. And it's quite interesting, but also quite challengingly. Uh, that three years is basically to um, go over the pandemic as I did take the role from 2018 to 2021. Mm. So especially in 2020 and 21, it's really the critical period to go through the pandemic yes. from China then to global. So I did that role for three years. Uh, then in April 2021, I did have the chance to take over the role uh, for supply chain head for food and refreshment. And, and I moved to Netherlands to take over the role. It's also very proudly, I am actually was the first woman EVP in supply chain world in Unilever history. So very happily and proudly that um, after I'm taking over the role, now we have more senior woman leader in supply chain uh, for Unilever as well. Then the role was actually evolved to a, a kind of the supply chain head role for nutrition in the new Compass organization from July last year. Wonderful. And great to hear the progress as well too, you know, the achievements both in China and in the global role yeah. and great to see the impact that now there are other women taking Indeed. more leadership positions. Yeah. I'd love to go back to some of your work in in Asia, especially around the global lighthouse manufacturing mm -hmm. facilities. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about um, those facilities and what their kind of impact has been? Sure. I think for those people who may not necessarily be very familiar with the definition of the lighthouse, uh, the manufacturing, basically I think this is the uh, the current high standard assessment and also the recognition for those most advanced manufacturing uh, the uh, location to utilize the force industry evolution uh, leading edge technology uh, be applied and implemented in the manufacturing. So uh, that kind of the assessment and award is actually uh, made by uh, World Economy Forum also quite happy and super, super proud. I always quote that as uh, one of my biggest achievements is that um, in my uh, role in both North Asia and also the role in food and refreshment, uh, in consecutive three years, we have been leading uh, to have three uh, the manufacturing sites uh, to get the lighthouse manufacturing site uh, uh, the awarded. So the first one is actually a manufacturing uh, uh, site in Hefei, east part of China, which is um, a site to produce the home care and the personal care product. And by the way, this is a site with around 20, 22 years history. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that when I moved to the Europe, I understand that 20 years, uh, the history of a manufacturing site sounds really young. As in <laughs> Europe, you will be very easily to step into a manufacturing with more than 100 years oh, wow. history. Um, but in China, uh, the definition of 20 years factory is quite old. <laughs> As we, uh, I can still remember we built it from 2002. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the first site that we committed. We want to see how digital transformation can really be landed and can be impacted in the operation. Uh, when we started to ride on this journey, to be very open, we actually do not have a lot of knowledge of what is really Lighthouse mean and what is kind of the technology and the digital transformation we can do. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of the learning, the agenda on, uh, online with our suppliers, our equipment, 
partners and also our internal um, the digital team doing a lot of things and uh, try trying an error uh, some investment is not it's not always all the investment and all the transformation is really successful. So I have to say we have a lot of trying and error, um, but very happily we get uh, the uh, first lighthouse in uh, China, I think in 2020 in history. Uh, then after that, we started to be see um, as if we can make it a lighthouse for our home care and personal care factory. Can we copy all the learnings and uh, to simulate uh, the same uh, the program in the different category and a different industry. So we do the second one for our ice cream uh, the factory, which is very different technology, core design, and also the impact on the things. Mm -hmm. But the second year, we make our first ice cream, uh, the, uh, the lighthouse in China as well. Then uh, when I'm moving to the food and refreshment, uh, we actually in the whole network of the uh, uh, the lighthouse uh, the network we don't have any food factory uh, to be awarded the lighthouse so we try to see if food we can do the same thing as well or not then very happily last year we got our Tianjin site in north part of China to be awarded lighthouse again so that is an, a nice journey uh, that you can see the digital transformation can be tried then can be copied and it can be rolled out across all the category from home care personal care to ice cream then to food uh, the business that's excellent I'd love to like double click into that and understand yeah. you can pick any site but what are some mm -hmm. of the technologies that have stood out as as really making an impact uh, mm -hmm. for the factory and the output. Yeah, I think a lot of things we can do, like the first is that how to do the automation as much as possible uh, in the whole processing uh, the area and the packing area to drive the efficiency and effectiveness of the factory. And, as, and also you have a lot of the new AI technologies that you actually uh, can uh, base on all this, uh, the the sensors to collect the real-time data, mm -hmm. then to let you know what is the potential issues and the challenges, and support you to do a very quicker or more precise decision to do the improvement in the whole process. And also, um, we actually utilize some AI technology to improve the safety quality and safety uh, the operation on site, as you can actually have the uh, smart camera to uh, capture the unsafe behavior mm. in the factory, uh, uh, the field, and uh, do the, uh, the the real alarming immediately, and you can then uh, make the correction very, very quickly. And also, I think uh, uh, the whole digitalization is actually help super, super on the quality uh, the standard of our products as well. So we have a lot of examples to say uh, the productivity can be improved by 70 to 90 percent. It's really amazing. And also our service level, well, you can actually you leverage a lot of the digital uh, and the data process to integrate with your suppliers to make sure real-time availability of the key raw packaging material and also to integrate it with your downstream uh, the players like your logistics, your truck, your customer, your consumer to make sure that you produce what really the consumer or customer will be needed. Mm -hmm. So you see the service level in a lot of cases will be improved. And also you see uh, the other big element uh, by driving digital is that on sustainability. We do see a more smart usage of energy. Mm -hmm. So energy consumption can be reduced by a lot. Uh, then carbon footprint is also get more positive impact on the whole planet. So there's a lot of examples I can be on and on for many, many uh, hours. No, no, that's wonderful. It's really fascinating, especially digging into like the details of the different aspects that can be improved. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason that China's leading in mm -hmm. these uh, fact in like in in these lighthouse factories versus um, or, or the global global footprint? Sure. I think um, first I would like to say uh, we are quite lucky as a Chinese that you have a relatively better ecosystem. And as I was in China, I I was. Um, uh, joking to say the life in China is more or less, especially the life in China for me to manage a, a supply chain is kind of live with the fear that if you do not uh, know new things or catch up new things, you will lag behind very easily. Mm. As every day you hear some new things about the technology, about the digital application, about some new business model. And though not always everything is really a true disruption 
or innovation, but there's something really going on every day. So you keep learning and you keep understanding. I used to uh, uh, to take more than 30% of my time when my role in China to be engaged with external, uh, to understand what is the new things outside, to visit the different suppliers and also the ecosystem to understand things. That's excellent. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like the pace was incredibly yeah, fast too, of understanding what was yeah. happening, what new opportunities or partners were out there exactly. and an incentive to really act quickly on it. Yeah, yeah. And you can actually, uh, when we're trying to do something we don't know, it will be rel uh, relatively easy to find some people or some suppliers that they are quite advanced in the area already. So you can, you can actually collaborate uh, collaborate with them and uh, learn a lot from your ecosystem. So that is one of the really the, um, the beautiful things uh, we have uh, in China. Then the second one, I think it's a kind of the culture or say, I like that is the bias for action. Mm -hmm. I think uh, when we talk about something, when we think of uh, something, actually people will debate it less about if we should do it or why we should do it, mm -hmm. or whether we should do it. We're just to say, okay, this is interesting. Let us just try something. Let us move to the action. Then you may succeed, you may fail, but even you fail, you get a bit of the learning. Right. So that bias for action and the move to the speed is also reduce a lot of the implementation lead time to make it happen and also to roll it out very, very quickly. Then the last piece I think is that uh, we have a lot of the digital talent, I have to say, and uh, we have a more digital savvy younger generation. Mm -hmm. They just live in the digital world. So, com so completely different from the world that, that my generation was grown mm -hmm. and, uh, and live. So all those type of things is just help you to grasp more eagerly and more quickly on the new opportunity and move faster. Yeah, I love the speed, the ability to, the thought of like experimentation, right? Mm -hmm. Let's run the trial exactly. and find out how quickly we can get results that decide whether we make a next step or not, what learnings we have, sure. and then powered by the talent that really understands the stuff and is also able to move quickly and smartly on those yeah. things. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. I'd love to move on to talk about uh, your global role in nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, you uh, Unilever makes brands like Hellman's Mayonnaise, uh, Knorr, Bango, and Vegetarian Butcher. We talked a little bit about the difference between China and, and your global role in, in the manufacturing facilities. Are there mm -hmm. other major differences uh, that stand out to you? Yeah, I, th I have to say it's a big difference, um, especially if you compare, so we talk about the nutrition business. So it's all talk about the food and uh, different uh, the uh, product to uh, help you make the cuisine. So in the food industry, I have to say, if you, you work in the nutrition business in Asia versus you work in the nutrition business in Europe or in States, it's completely different worlds. You have very little overlap of the portfolio and the product. Mm -hmm. Like for the Helmo mayonnaise, as I said, it's loved by a lot of the US people. Um, but in China, it's maybe very few people to know that because the cuisine is not relevant uh, to that one. Especially for the food industry and the business, you have very much local for local understanding. Mm -hmm. A business in Asia, a business in Europe, a business in US is super, super different. And, and also I think uh, for food and the uh, quality and safety is the king or queen for the business. Mm -hmm. um, if, um, if we don't have the quality of the product and the safety for our consumer, then you never talk about the taste, you never talk about all the other things. But I think especially uh, in Europe and the US, I have to say the whole society is much advanced uh, to um, embrace the green agenda, the sustainability agenda um, on how to reduce the plastic, mm -hmm. how to really reduce the carbon emission, and what is the best way as every individual as consumer, as customer, as manufacturer, as supply chain, you can embrace that a lot more aggressive. That I did see, we are in a much advanced stage in the west part of the world compared with the east part of the world. That's great insight. You gave a talk on resiliency mm -hmm. um, in nutrition. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your resilience strategy, and especially, um, I know one of your the, your core elements is around regenerative agriculture. So I'd love mm -hmm. to hear a little bit more about like the goals you have and the initiatives you have 
to bring that to life. Sure. I think uh, re- uh, the resilience, as I said, before COVID, um, maybe the resilience is just a professional topic that will be within the supply chain professions and talk about what is the alternative or the backup plan or the contingency plan you can do. I think it's really during the pandemic and COVID period that uh, you put the supply chain availability and the supply chain resilience in the front stage. Mm-hmm. I can still remember during that days, as long as you can be able on shelf, you are the winner <laughs> as you win with the um, the consumer. Yes, And so that is really more and more you see resilience not only become a unique strength uh, for supply chain, but can be really a competing edge for the business. By saying that, and the risk or the disruption is actually uh, be continuous more and more. We did have a hope after the COVID to say the overall situation of the supply chain disruption can be a bit eased, but in reality not. Mm -hmm. You actually see the disruption is even more and more every day from everywhere, not only the pandemic, but from climate distress and also from all the geopolitical challenges across the things. So I can talk up for the Unilever Nutrition. Mm -hmm. Resilience is one of our key priority or strategic agenda for us to drive end-to-end resilience. And we're really keen uh, to move the resilience agenda from a bit of reactive way to more proactive way, more manual way to more digital way, and also to be treated as a kind of uh, um, purely the cost to be really a value creation things. I will just share some example to say, talk about the Hellman, uh, the mayonnaise. Uh, one of the key ingredient is the sunflower oil. Mm-hmm. And in last 12 months, I think a lot of people has been experienced the frustration that you just do not find enough sunflower oil. And it's such a critical thing. If we cannot get enough oil, then we just don't have the mayonnaise for our for our consumer. Mm -hmm. So then it's really demonstrate how critical for us to build a resilience capability within the system. That's excellent. You mentioned in your talk, resilience is like insurance for supply chain. Can you expand upon that? Yeah, resilience is a kind of insurance. If nothing happened uh, in the normal period, you will really see it as a kind of the cost and you you try to eliminate it. But in case any disaster or anything's happen, then it's become really your true value creation to be winning edge for your business. So I think you have to shift a kind of the mindset to understand um, this is the insurance, this is the value creation, and this is really the design for your whole supply chain before the things happen, that you have the alternative, you have the backup plan, and you have the contingency plan. Excellent. Let's talk a little more about some elements of regenerative agriculture. What does that mean for your nutrition business or Mm -hmm. what are some of the most important things kind of coming out of that? Sure. I have to say uh, when we see more and more climate stress, the agriculture is a kind of the uh, chain that we actually feel and suffer that most strongest. I just take some example um, uh, that in last 12 months, just within the nutrition, uh, the uh, the business, we have more than 1000 calamities uh, we have to handle uh, and solve because of the lackness or because of unavailability of some critical ingredient from the agriculture. Um, it's very bad and very sad to see um, when you have drought, when you have flood, you just don't have enough tomatoes, you just don't have enough sunflowers, you just don't have even enough mustard seeds uh, to feed into our pro- uh, into our product. So in that sense, I think regenerative agriculture is really a critical long-term solution um, for the whole agriculture industry to be more resilient and more sustained, to maintaining the yield in a more sustainable way and a more stable way. By saying that, we are very cautious that it's not a short-term journey. You may not necessarily get the immediate benefit within the three, five years. You have to invest for the longer term. So I think we are really on that journey with all of our suppliers to be invest for the longer term. We do have the commitment to make uh, 650,000 hectares 
of the land linked with the ingredient we are buying to be completely regenerative uh, uh, the agriculture. By doing that, we can actually uh, to change not only the Unilever chain itself, but the whole ecosystem yep. in the agriculture industry and uh, make it more resilient and more agile to be face the climate um, uh, stress and also to have a bit of the positive impact uh, and to turn around the climate issues more aggressively. That's wonderful. I really appreciate that thoughtful answer. There's one other thing from your talk that really struck with me is about um, the technology application regarding resiliency. Mm -hmm. When certain goods are unavailable, then that replanning effort and mm -hmm. you have some technology actually helps you with like planning out those ingredient disruptions and planning out new formulations for mm -hmm. the food. Can you explain about kind of the technology there and like the timeline impact that's helped you with? Yeah, I think we do have a lot of the uh, the digital tools in our R&D uh, uh, center to be able to simulate uh, if you want to have alternative formulation and the recipe, what is the impact on the product texture, on the taste, on the quality, on the standardization of the product itself. In the old way, if you try to do an alternative formulation or recipe, it may take months as you need to take a quite long process uh, to uh, validate it with consumer feedback, to understand the subtle implication of the test perception. But I think with a lot of the AI technology and also the new digital tools, uh, you capture all the data from the whole system and you can have a lot of more, more quick way and a more predictive way to understand the impact on the taste, uh, on the quality, on all the things. We do have some uh, uh, the tools that you have more 80, uh, the modulars uh, for you to be able to, uh, uh, to test and validate a new recipe in a very short lead time. So we really move the needle from a reaction, uh, the lead time from months to now talk about weeks. That's incredible. It's great to hear about that impact. And again, just like so complicated, the number of factors going in and mm -hmm. changing one thing has a, a no, numerous applications using Definitely. the technology to do that. So that's great. Okay. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it hearing your insights about your career and the achievements that you've done globally at Unilever. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. That's it for today's episode of the Zero 100 podcast, Digitally Reinventing Supply Chain. See you next time.